This is the Limitless Faith, His Will, My Desire podcast show, episode number 15. Our show is about inspiring, encouraging, and impacting the apostolic community to embrace the calling of God and showing the world that the best life is living for Jesus through the power of testimony. You don't want to miss out on your blessings, so be sure to follow us and subscribe. What's up, Limitless Faith family? God bless you all. Hope you guys are having a wonderful week. And more importantly, a great start to 2021. Welcome back to another episode. And this week, we've got Pastor Edward Ford sharing his testimony, his story. He's currently pastoring with his wife in West Hartford, Connecticut. And the church is called Lighthouse Tabernacle. He shares his wonderful story of how God changed his heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And as a young man who was hard on the exterior, wasn't allowing anyone to come into his life and to see how God touched his heart and used others around him to be a blessing and how his life was impacted in a way here today, we see God using him as a pastor and being a blessing and reaching out and winning souls for the Lord in West Hartford, Connecticut. So please stick around to the end watch the whole story, listen to his testimony. If you can't watch it, we're available on all podcast platforms. So check us out. Uh, Make sure to subscribe and follow so you can stay up to date with the latest episodes. So hit that subscribe button right now. Hit it. Don't wait. Hit it right now and hit the bell for notifications. And also leave us feedback. Leave us comments. If there's anyone you would love for us to reach out and interview and bring on the show, let us know. We're all about sharing testimonies and stories that are going to be a blessing and impact every single community, everyone around the world that can listen and take a moment to see the amazing things that God is doing, right? These are real people. These are real stories reflecting God's glory. So love you guys. Thank you so much. We're also about to hit a hundred subscribers. All right. So let's get there and then let's hit the next mark of 200 subscribers. Love you guys. God bless you. Let's go ahead and listen to Pastor Edward Ford to my role. So Pastor Edward Ford, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? I am doing great. It's a great Monday and and uh, looking forward to the holidays this week. I'm doing phenomenal. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm excited to jump into your story, to jump into uh, your testimony. And, and really, as I always say to all of our viewers and listeners, every story, every testimony Every person I've had on the show so far, it's it's really amazing to see how God uh, reached out to them and what he's been doing behind the scenes up to this point to present day. So before I jump into that first main question, I wanted to see if it's okay if you can open up with prayer. I always like to open up with prayer. Is that okay with you? My pleasure. Be my pleasure. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, God. There's no one like you in all the earth. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your mercy that's upon us today. I thank you for Brother Javier, Lord, and the heart and vision to to do this this interview, Lord Jesus, this broadcast, Lord. I pray your blessings upon his life. And Lord, I pray above all, Lord Jesus, that you would get glory out of all of this, that someone would hear what's shared today, Lord, and Lord God would respond by saying yes to your will and your plan. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. amen amen awesome thank you so much pastor so first big question really is where was your beginning how did this all start for you and your walk with god did were you raised in the church or was it that someone at some point in your life shared the gospel with you well i was raised in church uh, my grandfather was a pastor um you know grew up in a military family So we weren't always where my grandfather's church was. And and to be clear, my grandfather pastored an an apostolic church, uh, you know, Book of Acts, New Birth, uh, you know, baptism in Jesus name, Holy Ghost, evidence, speaking in tongues. And so he uh, he pastored a PAW church, um, but we were a military family. So we moved around quite a bit in my early childhood, especially. Uh, but my parents always brought me to church. And so my sister and I, and so I was raised in church. Um, I remember, you know, I was what they call a kid under the pew uh, playing, you know, with, with toy cars and drawing on pieces of paper. And then you hear the moves of God 
you see people responding and my sister and I would kind of lift our heads up to see what was going on and, uh, it, you know, and, and see, you know, and feel even, even as kids, you know, the move of God. But then I had, uh, as a teenager, I had some, some rebellious years and, uh, you know, I got baptized when I was seven. Um, but I didn't receive the Holy Ghost until I was 15 years old. And, um, really I, I called myself at that point going to church, but not living for God. Um, right, right. You know, it, I, it's what I knew to do, but, um, really it took, um, in a, in, a, in a matter of years, I had two friends who were killed, um, and uh, and that really affected how I saw eternity, and just the fact that just because I was young, that I wasn't untouchable. You know, I had right. one friend who was fourteen, another died when he was sixteen years old, and I knew at that point that if something like that was to happen to me, and you know, I was shot or stabbed um, or I lost my life somehow that I was not ready uh, to see the Lord and to spend eternity with him. And that really sent me on on a search to get my heart right. And so that's where my that's how my journey began. So the age of 15, right? That's where it started at that age around there. Yes, I was a freshman in high school. Um, you know, Again, I, I mean, I wouldn't call myself a bad kid. You know, I, I wasn't in tons of trouble, but I wasn't hanging around the, the best crowd either. You know, people doing drugs and, you know, moral conversations and actions and so on. Um, right. you, you know, and I hung around that, you know, and so, uh, you know, but 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 again, it, you know, it was just a very critical point in my life. And yeah. And uh, but yeah, yeah, it was that time about ninth grade. Yeah. So first off, I'm, I know it's long ago, but I'm sorry for the loss of your friends, you know, and, and uh, to imagine the impact I've personally not had someone that close to me or have lost someone that close to me, but I can only imagine, you know, the scenario, the thoughts and uh, at that moment, what you had to go through. So I guess here as a sub question during that time, was there someone while you were now searching to to get back to Christ. And at the age of 15, was there someone around you within maybe your family or some close that made an impact and was a mentor to you as you were kind of getting back on the right path? You know, I was very much to myself. And I think a number of things play into that. You know, again, being that military family meant we moved. So there was always this being the new kid, being a loner, uh, you know, not having to make friends all over again with all of mm -hmm. that. And so, you know, around this time, um, you know, I was still pretty much the new kid where I lived. And, uh, you know, we, my, my family was visiting a few different churches. And so, you know, about that time that, uh, you know, my friend was killed, you know, my second friend was killed. Um, we started going to this new church and, uh, you know, they had a pretty thriving youth group and you know, at that point, my, my, I had a lot of animosity, frustrations in my life. And so I, I really had this hard exterior and I wasn't trying to let anybody in my world. I was, I was right. stonewall. And, um, you know, and so we started going to this church that had about, I don't know, 60 young people. And, uh, I knew some people from school there didn't know that they went to that church, but, you know, it made me want to come back. And over time, uh, you know, God used my youth pastor and another youth leader to really get in my world. But I was a tough nut to crack because <laughs> I, I was so hurt and frustrated. Right. I was scared to let anybody in my world. Right. You know, uh, but yeah, I mean, and so Brother Eddie, you know, I mean, if he ever ends up watching this, I mean, I, I think and Brother Eddie and Brother Joe, um, I don't know where I'd be without those two in my life and how they poured into me. And I think what finally really softened my heart was, uh, was actually my 15th birthday. Um, you know, I was new. I was very isolated. I, I was not trying to hang with the youth group because I thought I was too tough for them. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not you know, I'm not hanging with these church kids, even though I grew up in church. But at that point, my company was, you know, a different kind of company. And, uh, you know, so I stayed to myself when I was at church and Long story short, 
the church youth group do a surprise birthday party for me. And it melted my heart because I felt like I, I just never anticipated anybody caring for me like this. And it was just finally like, okay, man, stop being so tough around these people. They love you. They care about you, you know, and, and, and the God that they're, they're offering, you know, I always felt like I loved God, but I, again, it made me more open and hungrier to want right. to pursue a closer relationship with the Lord. Yeah. And, and getting to hear your story, I got to say, cause I, I met you, um, for all of our listener viewers, I, I met brother Ed when I was about between 15, 16. So, um, I, I don't know if you remember but brother, but the first time I was filled with the Holy Ghost was actually in CT youth camp. Um, and that was, I think in, uh, was it Manchester at that time? I'm trying it to think would have been it. in Ashford. Ashford. Yeah. Ashford. So I, I got filled with the Holy Ghost, August 10th, 2010, 2010. and wow. Tuesday, Tuesday night. And, wow. um, I believe you, you were, you were the president at that president time at that time. Yes. So, so that was really the first time that I, I got to meet you and sister Lissa and, um, and really to hear your story and how kind of God is, was working with you at, at your age. And to think back then when I was 15 around freshman year two, when I gave my life to Christ. And, um, and so I guess what I wanted to kind of get to is meeting you. I was like, man, brother Ed is so, he's always so happy. He's so social. I mean, he's always got a smile on his face. Uh, so to kind of hear that the background initially, you just, you had this exterior of hardcoreness. Um, where where did it take? And I, I know it's the Lord, right? Where He did that change? Where now you're you're just always happy. You're you've got a smile, no matter what you're going through. You're like, all right, God's got this. And and you were so outgoing. You poured your heart into all the young people. Uh, even as youth president, you still today pour your hearts to so many. At what point do you think uh, when you started your walk with Christ, and and what age? Did you feel like, okay, I'm starting to love people more. I'm starting to, I, I'm starting to be more social extrovert. I'm starting to reach out to more, you know, uh, when did that change start to take place? Absolutely. I would say, you know, crazy enough. <laughs> uh, I would say my first youth camp, my first youth camp was uh, summer of 1995. It was in between freshman and sophomore year of high school. I'd just gotten the Holy Ghost in March of 95, my freshman mm -hmm. year, and I was just learning to fall in love with Jesus, you know, you know, listening to worship music for the first time, you know, praying in my, you know, praying every chance I could get, reading the word every chance I could get. And I remember going to that youth camp and it just never been to anything like it in my life. Right. I was so impacted and just had again, landmark memories that I, that I still remember to this day. And I remember that last night of that youth camp and just the commitments we made to God that night that we were going to go back and we were going to reach, you know, our schools for God, our friends for God. And I remember that that was the first time I really began to feel a burden for souls yeah. and to love people. And I think one thing is you cannot give what you do not have and so spending time in the presence of God filled me with love to the point to where, you know, if we spend enough time in the love of God, then what we have is overflow. And that's what we pour out to people. And I, that's where I really began when I began sophomore year, you know, I'm like, okay, Lord, here I am, Lord, I'm your servant, whatever you want, however you want to use me to reach people for you. And, and this I'm is sophomore year of high school? Sophomore year of high school. Yes. And would you say, is that where you started to feel that calling to the ministry or when did, or it was a little bit after that? I'd say a little bit after that. Honestly, I, you know, I never, at that point, I didn't see myself being a preacher. I just loved God and I wanted to love people. And then I, I remember my youth pastor coming to me and, and said, uh, you know, it's something I didn't even really go to him. I just wanted mm -hmm. to do whatever the Lord wanted. Honestly, I just wanted to see souls saved you know, taught a Bible study in my, in my high school and all of that. And not even looking for a pulpit, honestly. I mean, I, I was not looking for one. And then my youth pastor came to me and said, uh, you know, we had youth services every so often. And he came to me and said, all right, our next youth service, you're preaching. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
me, I've never done this before. You know, I know how to have conversations with people, but I don't know how to have a, a I don't know how to preach, you know, and, you know, even my grandfather being a preacher, you know, uh, I'm like, but I've never done this before. And he worked with me and he, you know, taught me how to study and prepare, you know, and but more than anything about prayer. And I just remember inviting all my friends as many as would come from school. And mm-hmm. then our, you know, our church youth group was there. And, I, you know, it's crazy. I still have a VHS tape from that night. My first sermon was December wow. 97. I got a transfer at some point. But, you know, <laughs> you know, I stuttered all through that thing. I mean, you know, my family came, my grandfather came, you know, who was a pastor. Yeah. And um, the Lord did some things. And it, it look, even as I've looked at that video, I've looked back and say, Lord, uh, you really are just, it's not about the qualified. You're just looking for someone who's willing to give their bag lunch to Amen. you. Yeah. And you'll multiply it. And so that's that's where I first time I preached. And that's when I really first began to feel a call, you know, a call of God upon my life around that time. That's awesome. That's I think it first off, I think it's super cool that you remember the first time you preached. I I I can't say that I can't remember the first time I preached. Um, but but to think back, I think I do remember where it happened. Um, and how old I was, but I don't, I just don't remember what service it was. I'm, I mean, I'm sure we can, I, anyone that preached for the first time, we can all really and say how nerve wracking that moment was, oh, yeah. whether it's three people, four, 10, 20. I mean, it's, we, we respect the pulpit and, and we understand that it's not, it's not a show. We want to be sensitive to God's direction. And more importantly, we don't want our flesh to come as conflict and and hinder what God wants to do. Yeah. Um, that's awesome to see uh, how God started kind of walking you and in these steps. So, for you, brother Ed, when did you when did you uh, come to a point? So now, okay, so you're going through high school. Uh, you've come. So you preached for the first time while you were still in high school. While Is that I was right? In high school would have been my that was my senior year. Senior, year, senior okay, year, beginning of my senior year. So would we say, okay, so would we, at one point now, did you, actually, I don't want to assume, what was the first ministry you kind of dove into? Because again, I met you and Sister Alyssa uh, in the youth ministry. Was that the first ministry you jumped into? It definitely was. I I mean, I was greatly impacted by youth ministry and and really, um, you know, I mean, I graduated in 98, went five hours from my hometown to college. Mm-hmm. There's no apostolic church there. There, there was no, you know, um, ended up finding a friend. You know, I was a freshman, obviously, that year. My friend was a senior. He drove two hours every weekend to his hometown wow. to go to church. And so I, you know, when we realized we were both apostolic, I'm like, can I catch a ride with you? And so that, you know, that first year and a half that I was there, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, took a ride with my good friend who is still one of my best friends today was in my wedding and on, on and on. Um, uh, Orlando, if you're watching this, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, and I would go there every weekend, but, you know, after my first year and a half of, of school, mm-hmm. uh, of college, my mom got sick with cancer. And, uh, and, you know, at that time, my sister was away at school, uh, my dad was always working on the road. And so my mom was home alone quite a bit. And, and so I felt, you know, it was also about that same time that my youth pastor called me and said, you know, I want to know if, if, you know, you would, you know, desire to, to be a part and, and assist me in youth ministry here at our church and just prayed about it and talked to my family about it. And, I just felt like, well, my mom's, you know, sick and I need to be there with her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I need, you know, I felt kept feeling like I needed to come back to my hometown, which is in Virginia at that, at that time, um, Hampton, Virginia. And so, you know, I made the move. I I left uh, school and I transferred to college in my home city, live with at home with my mother and that, and I got involved in youth ministry at my local church, you know, where I came to the Lord, where I got the Holy ghost. Right. And so, you know, he asked me if I would be willing to, 
to teach middle school students. And so really it was sixth, seventh and eighth graders. I was 19. I mean, these guys aren't that much uh, younger than me, right. um, you know, at that time I'm 19, they're 12, 13, 14, but that's where, you know, I really began to teach them. I picked them up, began to counsel them, um, you know, was there and all of their challenges and everything and, and just did life with them. Just try to really lead them to Jesus and teach them, and model a life. And honestly, I had a great example. My youth pastor was a phenomenal example. He That's really awesome. lived evangelism in front of me. He lived prayer in front of me. He knew how to break through in the spirit. And I saw that and just learned those were things that, you know, I, I had a wonderful example. And so I wanted to do that same thing. And that's how I got my start in youth ministry. So 99 uh, was when I came back. And, and really, that's when I... I, I officially began in ministry. So would you, would you say there was any, you know, you're 19 now, were there any challenges that you had to come to face? Cause I, I, again, hearing your story brings back memories to me when I, the first ministry I jumped in was youth. And I can remember that for me, I thought, Oh man, okay, boom, let's win as many of our young people as we can. But yep. then I started noticing, well, yes, I am a little older, but not that much, but the generation isn't exactly the same. It starts to change a little bit. Sure. And uh, so were there any challenges that you took note that you had to kind of make some adjustments and you grew? And I mean, we all do, but would, is there any challenges that you can share that you had to come to face? Sure. I, I think number one, it really taught me about time management. Um, yes. You know, Amen. I was a full-time student. I was working. I was in, you know, in ministry at the at youth ministry. Um, and, and again, the fact that I wasn't that much older than them, I think um, they, you know, students know that. And so, you know, I, I think the whole respect factor and how would I approach that? And, you know, it, it wasn't like I was 10, 15 years older than them. I was five, six, seven years older than them, you know? And I, and I think the biggest thing was me not necessarily fighting for respect, but me loving them. And, and I think at the end of the day, as I just loved them by the time I spent with them, by, you know, believing in them, encouraging them, you know, pouring into them, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how many meals I bought. I don't know how many, you know, mm. didn't drink coffee back then. You know, don't know how many times I, I took a few of them to the mall to hang out or to the right. football game or, or, you know, how many times they were in a jam and they called me. And obviously I have my own life going on. Right. Right. But, but, but those times that I prayed with them, um, you know, in, in, in times that they were going through this at home or going through this at school yeah. and, and I, you know, they found me to be a safe place where they could be vulnerable and real the respect came. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And, and I think, and even the respect piece wasn't necessarily number one, but it, it's, I think just once, once they realized I really loved them and I had no other motive, but then, to, but to see them prosper in God, it really just made them want to go deep and made them want to reach their friends. I think the biggest compliment you know, of, of youth ministry, especially, but even of church is when someone invites a friend, when someone invites someone they know to what you're leading, they're saying, I trust this place. I trust this leader. And, um, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's a great way to put it in terms of how you've kind of illustrated there. When one of your young people brings a friend, they're saying, I trust this place. I, I, I can understand that. I've never thought about it that way, actually. But thinking back when I would take my friends, that's really the mindset that I had. I trust my pastor. I yeah. trust this family. I trust this community. I trust the examples around me yeah. that they're going to be a good influence to all the young people, even if it's one or five, but that when they come here, they're going to say, hey, Javi, I, I just want to let you know that that was awesome. That that was a great place. Everyone's so nice. Everyone's so loving and that they take note of that. So I really love how you put that. And um, to fast forward just a little bit here in your walk of, of memories together. Now, 
it brings me back when I had interviewed Brother Nate Greeley. He had shared with me how much of an impact you had made into his life when uh, you had invited him to now be a part of the uh, Connecticut youth team and and the books that you would recommend uh, him to read and to invest in himself and to grow and then to start working with the youth. And um, it was it was funny, you know, talking about it. He's like, you know, Javier, I. I just, I'm willing to do anything. Even if I wasn't good at anything, I'll, I'll do it. Let's give it a shot, you know? And, and it's yeah. exactly what you were talking about, where just have a willing heart, have willing hands, and God is going to take control. So kind of walk me through this moment now. You Now you're a youth leader at 19 or in the youth uh, team at your church. But then as you're growing with time, where was it or when did that happen where now you start trans- transitioning to work uh, with the Connecticut youth team? Sure. Well, some major transitions happened. I mean, you know, I you know all this youth ministry that I've talked about to this point was in Virginia. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll give the long story short for time's sake. But but there was a conference uh, that I went to in Maryland uh, each year. Powerful conference. Brother Lee Stone King, Brother Sam Emery preached it every year. And, and uh it was a singles conference, but I honestly, I was not going there looking for a mate. You know, I, I figured mm-hmm. maybe I'll find one here, but that was not my, my primary f- focus. You know, I was just hungry and there was a such depth of the spirit in this conference. And so I went there every year and, and, you know, when I was 20, uh, I ended up meeting who would be my future wife from Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and the following year at age 21, I proposed to her and, and I thought that I would be, um, you know, my plan. And she was a single mom. You know, my wife was a single mom. When I met her, she came to God. She wasn't raised in church and that's her story. I'll let her tell that story, but you know, and so at that time she was a single mom with a three-year-old boy and, um, you know, but she was on fire for God. And I had such a deep respect for her walk with God and her prayer life. And, And, uh, you know, I, you know, as we got to know each other and just had that kindred spirit and hunger for the things of God, you know, I'm, I know she, I knew she was the one. And so at first I thought, well, she's going to come down to Virginia. They're going to come down to Virginia to be with me. But after an extended time of prayer and fasting, um, I, I, it was just, God ended up rocking my world and it became so clear that he was calling me to Connecticut. Wow. So That's in awesome. 03, you know, uh, I, I went from being a single college student to an instant family man and moving to an entirely different state, 500 miles from home, right. no family, um, you know, but my, my, my new family. And so there was some absolute major, major, major life change, even just a new culture, you know, the Northeast mm-hmm. versus the South. Um, and just an extreme, massive life change for me. Uh, but I went there to work with youth as well. And, you know, even more than that, um, felt a call. I felt a call for a community, uh, you know, that I'm pastoring in right now. Yeah. I even moved here and, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but you know, the, the uh, Connecticut youth, honestly, I was just serving our youth in Manchester at the time. Uh, you know, wanting to pour into them what God had placed in my heart to put pour in any young person, you know, whether in Virginia and now here and, you know, totally different culture than what I was from. But, and I had to, I had to adapt to that. You know, if I was going to connect with these young people, you know, I had to learn where they were and, 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 you know, love, love translates the same, no matter who right. it is. Right. But I understood that if I was going to see the love of God reached for them, I had to get to where they were and connect where they were. And, and so, uh, you know, really, um, you know, a few years after doing that, you know, I was voted by our, our ministerial body to, to be secretary and then eventually president. And um, I felt like it was just another opportunity to serve. And I just felt like, however, I can serve the youth and help them reach for their call you know, and even, even other youth leaders, you know, and other counselors, you know, however I can, it's not about what I can get in return. It's about how the kingdom of God can be affected. And, and it's been such a blessing to see, you know, like even brother Nate Greeley, who's our current youth president. I love him so much. 
and, and others, you know, and all glory be to God. I think it's just, it takes people getting out of their own way right. and saying, it's not about me. Mm-hmm. And to say, what can I give to others so that they can be who God created them to be? Because someone gave that to me. And who would I be if I didn't give that to somebody else? As, as we have freely received, we must freely give. And so I'd say that's how I got into Connecticut youth. And I enjoyed my time there immensely. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I want to take a moment just to not to sidetrack, but I think this is an important topic also before I continue forward is you had mentioned how when you had met Sister Alyssa, who is now your wife, um, in the singles conference, she was living in Connecticut right at that time. Yes. Right. And you were in Virginia. So this is actually, I think, important. I've, I've asked others that I've interviewed to kind of share a little bit of advice, because when you find that that partner in ministry, uh, your teammate, your soulmate, uh, the person that you're going to walk the the journey of life with. Um, but you live in two different places, but you both feel the calling from God. You both feel like we need to serve and give our very best for the kingdom. You had mentioned something important that you were praying and fasting that God just flipped your world upside down. In that moment, just kind of take me back in that moment while you were praying, while you were fasting. I think it's essential for any other couple, any of our viewers or listeners that may be engaged, they're going to get married. And they don't know where to go, right? They, they're they they're both in different places and they're asking, well, God, where do you want me to be? You know, so uh, kind of walk me through how long did you pray or how long did you fast during that time? Well, I mean, obviously it was always a matter of prayer. You know, I knew my wife and I were, you know, obviously we were started off as friends and, and I was really starting to have feelings for her like I had had for nobody else. And it scared me. I mean, I, I, I never... <laughs> Uh, I had never felt like this for someone in my life. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness, like, like I really love her. Um, and, you know, and at the same time, wanting to please God, not wanting to put her before God. And so it was always a matter of prayer. But I'll say that, uh, honestly, we started before I even proposed to her, uh, we started praying together on the phone. I, I said, you know, wow. because I felt like I had been to so many conferences, you know, and when you're late teens, early twenties, you're meeting all kinds of people, you know, not necessarily interested in a relationship, but it's just the nature of that season. You know, you're mm-hmm. meeting all kinds of, you know, young ladies and, and everyone to some degrees, you know, I wonder if they're the one, you know? Right. And, right. Uh, and, and so I'd met so many, conference girls, I'll say, who, you know, would shout it down and show out at conference. But then, you know, if you talk to them after the fact, it was just like, okay, well, where's your walk now? Where's your right. life now? Right. And I just wasn't interested in that. I wanted someone who had depth. I wanted someone who had substance in their walk with God. And I think what, what really pushed me over the edge, and this was before I even really, this was what pushed me over the edge concerning even my interest. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, we had just, just a few months after we had met, I called her to just see what I was going to a gospel concert and, you know, I called her to see what she was up to. And she said, I'm at the church praying. And this was like a, 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 you know, an evening. So I thought, Oh, maybe the church is having prayer. And, uh, and so I said, Oh, wow. You know, is it like church wide prayer? And she's like, no, no, I'm here by myself praying. And just spending time with God. Well, I connected with that because I did that. I wanted to spend those times alone with God. I we had a little prayer closet, you know, room area in our church building, and I would go there at at ten o'clock at night, two in the morning, to spend time with God. I would go there and have all night prayer meetings by myself, or bring a a, a you know a male friend, you know, and, and a brother of mine, yeah. and we would go pray. And, and so, and, and I just remember so many amazing moves of God in those moments. And I was like, wow, someone who goes by themselves and is, an, is, has initiative on their right. own without right. someone having to press them to pray. I want to connect. I, I, you know, I want someone like that. Yeah. And so that really was, um, what sparked my interest. And then I would say, as far as kind of what sealed the deal was, I mean, there was a point where I just knew even in, in, in my prayer time that she was the one just God kept bringing me back to it. It was more so a matter of where were we going to go? Was it going to be Connecticut or Virginia? And, um, and, but 
you know, for me, it was just, it was just fully always surrendering. And, and I think we, you know, in our, in our dating years, you know, we had 6 a.m. prayer every morning on the phone. You know, we would share devotion, uh, a, a Bible verse. Uh, we wanted our relationship to be centered around Jesus. Right, and, right. and, and really, and, and that's, that was the foundation of our relationship and, uh, and, and still is, you know, prayer, prayer is who we are. Um, and I thank the Lord for that. Um, you know, I don't know where we'd be without that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, and for all of our viewers and listeners that don't know sister Alyssa, she even started a conference and I would love to have her on the show, by the way, brother, I'd say she can share her testimony. Um, but she, sh- she started, I think it was last year, the first time, um, uh, prayer conference or change, change. I, change it's what it's prayer called. Conference. Yes. So, um, for you, for me to hear and for everyone to hear how important this is to have prayer and both together in that same page and that same mindset uh, is so essential. And I think it raises the standard to where everyone, I think every young person, every man and, and woman should have high standards for the person that they're looking for, who they want to marry um, and taking it seriously, right? It's not just simply checking off some boxes, right? Um, I remember, you know, my wife would would tell me because she had high standards for the one that she she was looking for to marry. And people in her church would be like, you're never going to find a man like that. Yep. That's impossible. And that's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, to hear to hear your story, it's just so awesome because again and again, it God is just so amazing that, yes, he can provide that right specific person. He wants you to be specific. And Brother Ford, you were specific. Uh, Sister Ford was specific. And this is exactly the example that every young person needs to follow. So that's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that part of the story. So again, I wasn't a sidetrack. I think it was just important to touch upon, you know? Amen. Um, so going back now, okay, so we're in Connecticut. You guys are, are serving the youth in uh, Manchester together. You're part of the uh, Connecticut youth team now, the youth president. Now, now I'm, I'm folk. Now I want to kind of jump into you because now both together are pastoring a church. Um, and I want to jump into how that process where God led you both and, and walked you through that uh, moment where you both came and said, okay, God's calling us to this new chapter, to a new place, this yeah. new, I, I don't know. Is it a town or a city? I don't know in terms of the population. It's, what is, it's a town. It's a it's big a town. town. It's, there's there's 65,000 <laughs> people here. So yeah. a decent sized town in West Hartford. So I want to, I want, um, I want to jump into that chapter now. So kind of walk me through a little bit of how we got there and then where you guys are, what the name of the church is and this beautiful town that you're in in Connecticut. Absolutely. Well, I tell you, I mean, it, it began, believe it or not, before I even moved here, before we were even married. Um, I was up in Connecticut visiting while we were still dating. Honestly, I don't think we I'd even proposed to my wife yet. I knew I was going to. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I, I knew we were going to get married. We both knew we were going to get married at that point. I just hadn't proposed yet. And, um, you know, I was up visiting and she was going to St. Joseph's College at the time in West Hartford. And so I was going to pick her up from school to have lunch. And so I picked her up from St. Joe's and we are driving down, which is in West Hartford. And we're driving down Main Street, West Hartford. And we're in uh, Blueback Square where Cheesecake Factory and all that stuff is now. It wasn't back then. Uh, but, uh, and I can't even tell you the spirit of prayer that moved in our car out of nowhere, we're, we're beginning, we just see people walking, we see households and we just begin to intercede. Mm. We're praying, we're crying, we're calling out to God for, I mean, a town I've never been to before in the town she's just been going to school in and we're just weeping, praying for Mm. households and just, it turned into a prayer drive before we went and grabbed lunch. And it was just so, I never felt that way for any community in my life. It was overwhelming. And I think it had to be because of all the series of events. You're talking about having that first moment in 2002 
and us not actually getting to West Hartford until 2013. And, and, and so, and there was a lot of journey in between that, you know, some mountains, some valleys in between that. And so, you know, there, you know, and so, but it was just, there'd be times amidst that period in between the initial vision and, and burden, um, you know, and honestly, you know, it's, it's something I, I went home. Let me rewind here. I went back to Virginia uh, that after that trip in 2002 and God had me write on a, a whiteboard, pray for souls in West Hartford. Mm. Do not be weary and well doing in due season. You shall reap if you faint not. This was all before I even moved to this state. I forgot wow. I had done that. God had put that in my heart. Even when I got back home in Virginia, God was just further solidifying that he was calling me to West Hartford. And I had, I, I was living in another state, you know, you know, hadn't proposed to my wife yet. There were so many things that just weren't even firm at that point where God was just calling me to West Hartford. And so I wrote that on that whiteboard back then. And so, you know, along the way, there'd be time just because of the, 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 the delay in time that I would wonder, you know, you know, was that just me? Was I just seeing things or, you know, did I really hear from you, God? And, and uh, you know, there, there's, there seems like there's opposition and challenges of, of what we felt that day becoming a reality. And God, every once in a blue moon would come and, and make something so clear. I was not joking. I did say West Hartford, you know, I, and, and, and so, you know, uh, and so people would come and share prophetic words, things that people wouldn't even realize, but God was using it all to build his resume. Yes, I am calling you. And I think what sealed the deal when I absolutely knew was at a youth service. I think I was just started to be youth president. It was a youth service and it was at brother Hanson's church Mm. um, at that time. And it was pastor Steve Smith. He's in Tennessee now but he preached about a lighthouse. And at this point, I had buried the idea that we were going to West Hartford. I'm just like, it's certainly not going to happen. And when he preached this message called the little red lighthouse, um, I can't even tell you how deep God spoke to me. I broke, I ran to the altar. I said, yes, Lord. Uh, I'm not going to question you anymore. You just get me there and, and I will do whatever you want me to do. And he did, you know, God, you know, through a series of events brought me to this place and, and, and he has been with us. And, and that's, that service, the little red lighthouse was, was when I knew it was going to be a church called lighthouse tabernacle um, without question. And so I'm thankful for that. That's awesome. That I was just going to say, and um, when you were saying, I was like, oh, that's how he came up with the name, Lighthouse yes. Tabernacle. Yes. That's amazing. And that's awesome. I didn't, I didn't actually realize that's where um, Sister Alyssa was, was from. So uh, does she sometimes come into contact when you guys are in service, people come in that maybe she's seen in school or grew up with? Anyone from those neighborhoods yet? You know, there are definitely people we're still connected with, some, mm-hmm. some uh, you know, some some connections we've made in the community and, and yeah. people that that my wife has been able to reach, you know, even you know she was in nursing school there. And I mean, and we've seen some nurses, you know, come to the Lord, be born again. You know, there's a couple awesome. of nurses right right now who have come and have been born again in a water and of spirit and are serving the Lord. And we give the Lord thanks for that. And so it just we never know why God puts us in a certain place or takes us through a certain process, but every step of the way, every step of the way, um, whether it's a mountain valley, you know, whether it's, you know, seems like the way is not clear. God has a purpose in every part of the process. Amen. Amen. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And, and, you know, just thinking about this process that you guys had gone through from beginning up to this point, it's, it's incredible to see the doors that God has opened in and really the steps that he's carried you in each and every one of these chapters and so many more to come, right? So many more to come. Um, So, so pastor, tell me about, you know, when you first 
now you're starting this new chapter with Sister Liz that you guys both started, um, are starting a church in West Hartford. You, this whole time, were both working in the youth ministry, transitioning now to be a pastor of a church. Did you feel like something switched? Something There was a little bit more, were there more challenges or more adjustments you had to make, more responsibilities? I, I, I'm trying to have trouble, I guess, trying to form the question, but do you, do you see where I'm trying to get to? I think so. Um, definitely. You know, I, I, you always, it's, it's, you always hear, and, and obviously being in ministry, I've had, I, I, I've had pastors. I have a pastor currently. Uh, Bishop Hanson's my pastor. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and I've had a number of pastors throughout my life. And so you think, you know, what the journey's going to be like, you know, I've had a pastor, I've had conversations, I've served alongside my right. pastor in various capacities, but you really can't know until you're in the seat and in the role and, and, you know, and it honestly serving in the role gave me deeper respects for every one of my pastors, mm. regardless of how they served, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you go from pastor to pastor, just because people are, have different personalities, different styles, people serve and do ministry differently. But at the end of the day, a pastor is still a pastor right. and that weight, that responsibility that, wow, it stops with me um, and how sensitive I am to God and what is my example, et cetera. Uh, it was a, a totally different weight than youth ministry. And honestly, you know, it's like making the transition, you know, I was praying about, you know, just, you know, my role at that time as youth president. And I remember the Lord telling me, um, you know, I, I, I want you to step down. I, I, I really want you to transition. And it was right before we would plant the church basically a year later. And so I, I felt God preparing us and I felt God shifting, you know, and I still have a great passion for young people. That'll never change. Right. Uh, but I, I felt like God was shifting me. I felt like I'm, I'm made for what I'm doing now. Yeah. And, 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 and God was using all those necessary parts of the journey to prepare, me, prepare my wife and I, my family and I for this journey. So I would say there was just a different weight of responsibility and, um, yeah, yeah. I, I would ultimately see, say that's, that's, that's the most of it is, is the weight, uh, before man and before God. For right. Sure. Right. No, I, that, that, um, cause that really leads me to where I was trying to get to. So I appreciate you jump kind of deep diving in that. Cause that's exactly what I wanted to kind of touch upon where just, as you said, it stops with you now, right yeah. now your pastor, it stops with you. Oh, yeah. And so I can only imagine right where now you're the last line of defense this whole time working in youth ministry if if you have a youth pastor now or any other one under you it's like okay well now it's different so like i was with the youth this whole time but now i'm gonna have someone take care of the youth um who you know actually let me ask you uh is it sometimes hard where you know do you sometimes want to like jump in or uh with the youth ministry or were you like okay no you know what i gotta let them fly they got this they can do this you know i, I think I think the first piece is knowing your vision and values. And it's, if there's anything I've learned, you know, we're in our seventh year of planning this church. There's been a lot of ministerial roles. Um, there've been people that, that uh, have worked out people who haven't worked out people who have bought into our vision, people who haven't bought into our vision. And I think any pastor, you know, they have to have a clear set of convictions and values and culture right. and something that we've really tried to develop here at lighthouse is this is our culture you know and 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 to articulate that and to say this is where we're trying to go so i think to some degree there's a balance you know yeah. uh i'm not here i don't want to be a micromanager but at right. the same time i understand that um Number one, if you're here serving in any capacity at this church, then we're all under the umbrella of the same vision and we've got to be in alignment. We've got to be going to the same place. And so if we're if we don't have that same alignment of vision, one person could be going here, another person going there. And then it, it's like, you know, we're stray cats versus a, a unit in an army 
advancing the kingdom of God. And so I think it's the balance of upfront, you know, something I do with our leaders. I'm always pouring in vision. I'm always right. pouring in culture. I'm always saying, this is how we do ministry here. And the, the truth is that, you know, in the church plant, you know, for the most part, I mean, there are so many people who have never, you know, they weren't raised in church. They're, they're, they're new disciples. Right. Um, they're, they're, you know, and honestly, sometimes they're the ones who take on the culture the easiest because lighthouse is their only reference. Right. But for those who've come from other places, they've, they've also taken the church cultures of where they've come from and brought it to where they are. And so it's like, okay, you know, you know, I love and respect every other, you know, church who preaches the truth and practices the truth, you know, but if you're going to be here, then, you know, you've got to adopt the culture here. And, and cause otherwise, if they don't adopt the culture here, then there's, there's going to be strain and they may not, even if it takes them time. And I think this is the biggest piece that I've seen. It takes time for that culture to mesh right? and in and, and going through the patience of saying, okay, as a pastor, I'm willing to be patient. And if there's a leader, I'm asking them to be patient number one, for us to get to know each other. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they're, they're going to need to know my style of leadership and, and, and adapt to that while at the same time, I'm trying to uncover their gifts, uncover their passions and try to position them in the place where they can fly in ministry and be fulfilled and letting them know that, Hey, I'm, I'm here to cheer you on, Uh, you know, but, but this, and so it's, it's a lot of moving pieces but I think the core of where effective ministry, I, I want to be careful not to say successful, but more so effective ministry, yeah. where there's results in people's lives being changed and growth happening. It happens in the context of love and, 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 and mercy and grace and truth and, you know, in, in time, you know, I heard, I'll, I heard a friend say it like this, uh, <laughs> I heard a friend say like this, there was a person, and this is a, this is a, a, a first lady who was saying this to my wife and she related to me, you know, there, there was a person who had, you know, was on their platform, you know, in, in the, in the choir loft chewing gum and the pastor's wife saw it and, and thought, um, man, I, 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 you know, I'm just disappointed that they're chewing gum. And they were, they were, they were about to correct that situation. And then the, the, that first lady of that church said, but I haven't made enough deposits in her life to correct her about this thing, particularly right. about gum. Now there's other things, major thing, more major things. Okay. Uh, that yes, you may have to speak to regardless of the situation, but chewing a piece of gum in this instance, this first lady realized I haven't invested enough in this person's life to correct or rebuke in. And, and because I haven't made inv- enough investments yet, right. I can't, I, I, I have to, I have to have a balanced view of how, what I expect from them because true growth and healthy growth happens in the context of relationships. It, it's like, Amen. it's like uh, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. And so this first lady realized I don't have enough relationship with them yet to enforce this without it being detrimental. And yeah. so I need to build more bonds. I need to make more deposits into their life, you know, and, and at the appointed time, if it's still an issue after I've got, more investment and they realize how deeply I really care, then maybe I can go here. God, that's, that's so good. That was so awesome just to hear how much information this is so valuable. Everything you're sharing right now for every listener and viewer, because, and I think this is a good segue to the the next segment of the show, which we're, we're almost coming to a close uh, as uh, part of giving advice to others. When, when I look at you, Pastor Forward, and I think about my pastor, Pastor Lapierre, and and all pastors, all missionaries, I kind of, in one sense, in my mind right now, the way I relate it is um, I'm big on investments. I love talking about finances. You and I have spoken about finances when we've seen each other sometimes, and Robert Kiyosaki and so forth. Yes. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've read 
is the discipline of a CEO, you know, how they became and got to be a CEO. And so hearing the value that you're really just dropping bombs right now, and I really hope everyone that that watches and listens takes note of this, because really the next question I'd like to ask here is to get to the part of where you, you answer God's calling, you let God guide you, and you're now there as a pastor. It's not a snap of fingers, right? There's this whole story, right? There's different moments to get there. So now you're a pastor. What advice could you give someone in terms of, because you mentioned time management, right? And you mentioned balancing and, and how you pour into your leadership. But now, uh, really the essence of behind the scenes where I think discipline is a key part in this, right? You've talked about prayer. And so I think looking into your story, everything that you've shared, it didn't happen when you were a pastor. It happened before preparing you to this role. And I think that's that's where I'm trying to get to, right? You don't develop what you need when you're in the position. You develop it before you get there and God prepares you. So can you talk to us a little bit about those key elements? You've already talked about the importance of prayer. You've, you've talked about time management. What else behind the scenes that is really important to kind of carry the position? You know, I, I, number one, you know, and I, I know I've already mentioned prayer, but private devotion with God. I, I mm -hmm. cannot emphasize that enough. You know, I've been in ministry officially for 21 years and you see a lot, you know, I'll be 40 next month. And, you know, I started when I was 19 years old and you know, I, I'd say early on, you see it less and less the older you get, um, because I think the journey weeds a lot of people out. Um, but, you know, early on, you know, early 20s, especially, I'd say my 20s, especially, you see so many people jockeying for position, trying to rub shoulders, trying to make the right connections, trying to climb a ladder and, and thinking that that if I got this right connection I take the right picture and I post it, you know, on social media, <laughs> who I'm friends with, preacher so-and-so, you right, know, right. Or, or, you know, they're, they're, the, they're, they're the Pentecostal groupies. They're, you know, they're looking to mob, you know, you know, <laughs> conference speaker yeah. uh, uh, after the conference. Let me see if I can corner him and all that, you know, but, but what God sees is the private place. Amen. And, you know, I have a, a prayer, you know, that says, you know, Lord, let my private devotion be greater than my public ministry. Let my right. private devotion, and even still to this day, Lord, check me if if I'm spending more time thinking about what's being projected publicly than the devotion I have privately. And I think of David, you know, and so, and just really how obscure he was. David never planned on being in the Valley of Elah that day you know, in, in the place of private devotion, he learned a servant's heart. He honored, he honored his father, which despised him. Mm. Think about that for just a yeah. second. Yeah. He honored, he not, he honored his father who despised him, who act like he didn't exist. Okay. And he goes to serve his brothers who also despised him. He's the youngest, right. he's the ruddy kid. He's the, yeah. he's, he's, he's the, who's that guy? Who's David? You know, yeah. he, he's tending the sheep. And, and, and so he, and he goes to serve brothers who despise him, you know, and, and, and his, 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 his standing before Goliath is not to prove something. Right. It's to serve his brethren. And, and he, he goes in that valley with nothing to prove other than to defend the God that he's loved and devoted himself to in private. And so, and so in that valley, God fights for him. And he gives the glory to God. But even after, you know, King Saul, he sends, you know, the story and, and all that. He, you know, whatever, he, he steps ahead of Samuel and the word of God. And, and so he's got this evil spirit and he calls David in and, and, and he, he chases after David, throwing javelins at David. David keeps proving, you know, you know, I'm not going to dishonor you, Saul. Right. He, he serves, he honors he serves, he honors. And that's under bad leadership. You know, that's under yeah. <laughs> bad leadership. Yes, and, that's a good point. But 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 God sees it and, and says it's he's a man after my own heart. And right. I think the thing is, is having a private devotion, you know, and never compromising on that. Okay. Never compromising. It's not about the sound bite, it's not about the tweetable post. 
It's about how connected can I get with God in my yeah. private life? Because yeah. the Lord says, I'll reward that openly. And then the other piece is this, how teachable can I be? Mm -hmm. How teachable, how much, because here's the deal, God, for every one of us, God, and the scripture's full of it, of good examples and bad examples. And we learn from both. We learn from both God Amen. and God, you know, we don't see this, anyone with a picture perfect story that does, isn't lied on, mistreated, who isn't forgotten, who, who isn't missed. We don't see anyone like that. You know, who isn't persecuted, you know, God calls the rain to fall and the just and the unjust causes the sun That's to right. shine and the just and the unjust. It's all part of the process and how we respond to it. And so if I can recommend anything is having a teachable spirit. I have under every ministry I've ever served under and in, in, in here, you know, I'll say this very clearly um, as a pastor, I'm the senior pastor of this church, but I, I, I resolve within my personal walk with God that I cannot pastor this church without a pastor in my life. Mm. I cannot pastor this church and shepherd this church and hold people accountable for their souls without having a man of God in my life that I don't allow to hold me accountable for my right. own soul. Right. And, and, and if, you know, how's my, how's my character, how's my marriage, how, how am I using my time and my finances and having a voice and, and I have elders, you know, every one of my elders have, has been run by my pastor. Mm -hmm. Hey, this person has invested in me. What do you think, sir? Is it all right if they speak into my life? How do you feel about that? And if he says yes, then great, green lights. If he says no, I'm closing that door. Right. Because not that I'm elevating my pastor as God, but I'm trusting God by trusting him. Yeah. And and I think I've, I've seen enough. I've experienced the good, bad, and ugly in ministry. I mean, and I, I won't go into details, right? Right. But I, I've I've experienced some very hurtful moments. Uh, I've been lied on. I've been misunderstood. I've been outcast. I've been rejected. Uh, I mean, I've I've experienced trials. Um, you know, just just unthinkable trials in all of that. And 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 yet, you know, what what sometimes those things do in people's lives, if they don't have a private devotion and if they don't have someone that they're spiritually accountable to, what happens is, is bitterness breeds. And mm -hmm. you think about it. You think two people that come to mind are David and Joseph. Right. You think about David. Okay. Despised by his father, his brothers chased after, you know, by, by King Saul. You think about Joseph uh, sold into slavery by his brothers, lied on by Potiphar's wife, forgotten in prison. What if, I mean, and, and, and God's allowing it all. Yeah. You know, God's yeah. allowing it all. And you can get mad at, at David's brothers or Joseph's brothers. You can get mad at Potiphar's wife or the fact that, that Joseph was forgotten. But at the end of the day, God allowed it. And right. God saw fit for those things to be a part of the process that would bring both David and Joseph into the purpose that he had for them. If, if, if Potiphar's wife never lied on Joseph, I believe he never would have gotten to the palace. Right. He had to get into that prison first. He had to be misunderstood and lied on first. Okay. Or he would have never been in a position to interpret the dreams and he would have never been called up out of prison to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. Right. And if he has a bitter spirit in that process, then he's, he's, he's going to stop serving. Mm-hmm. He, he's going to say, nah, I'm checked out. No interpretation for you today. <laughs> I hear you. That's good, man. Wow. You know, wow. And, so if, and, so, <laughs> and so having that private devotion, having that teachability, having, can I be rebuked? And I, seriously, I asked my, and I'm, I'm a senior pastor, okay? And, and at least a few times a year, and I mean it. Yeah. I talked to my pastor, Pastor Bishop Hanson. And I say, sir, you know, we'll be in a fellowship or whatever, or, or just, you know, just having some, what you know, connecting. And I, I make sure I spend, I get some time with my pastor. But every once in a while, I'll say, pastor, I just, I need you to tell me, tell me, do you feel like I'm still teachable? Mm. Do you still like, you still feel like you can correct me? 
do you still feel like you can rebuke me if you need to be? And, and I've strived to live that way everywhere I've served. And right. I haven't always agreed with my pastor. I haven't always, you know, seen eye to eye. That's human nature. And I realize right. Right. because I've served under a ministry, I recognize that people who serve under my pastoral ministry aren't always going to see eye to eye with me. And so how do I handle that? How do I handle when they don't, and when we don't see eye to eye, you know, and I think part of, I can, part of why I can preach and impart about having a teachable spirit is because I strive to live that way. And I understand that leadership is exampleship and I strive to model that, not just so I can say, Hey, you know, my Bishop corrects me so I can correct you. But it's more so it's a biblical principle that God loves whom he corrects, you know. And so, you know, I think that private devotion and having a teachable spirit to say, you know, I, I'm still in learn mode, no matter what God's done, no matter what feats you think about it. Even David, you know, slaying Goliath. Yeah. You know, I mean, put me on the throne now. You know? <laughs> but that's not what happened. Right, right. <laughs> and. And there was a series of teachers and ex teaching mm -hmm. experiences that he still had to go through in order for God to bring him to his purpose. So those are the two things, private devotion and, and unwavering commitment to that, because that's how we stay saved. I truly believe that it's not, yes, we, it's the preach word that leads us into salvation, but it's our private devotion that keeps us saved. Amen. And then having a teachable spirit. Uh, uh, you know, as unto the Lord. Right. And, and, and as, as I do that unto the Lord and through the, the pastor he's put in my life, the, the people of God he's placed in my life, I believe God also uses those to help develop me and help, you know, keep me in alignment. Hey Amen. That was, that was great advice. That was great advice. And uh, brother Ed Ford, I know for the sake of time where we, uh, we've hit that limit, but just very quickly sure. to close, um, are there any couple books that you can recommend to our listeners and viewers that they should take the time if they if they do it, that it's going to be a blessing to them? And where could people continue to, to see you and, and your beautiful family to see God be glorified in these next chapters? Amen. Uh, well, I, I'll start with your last question. Um, I'm on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> look, up, look me up, Edward Ford, or you can look at our, our uh our lighthouse page. My wife is on Instagram, but I'm not. Um, but, but our lighthouse Facebook page, uh, it's, it's facebook.com slash a lighthouse West Hartford. That's where you can connect to what God is doing in our lives. And we're, we're thankful. And obviously our, our personal pages on Facebook, but, but, um, as far as books go, um, just some books that are really, obviously number one is the Bible. Um, you know, you, you can never read enough and meditate enough on the word of God. Amen. But then some other books that are, are faith based that have really shaped who I am, um, how I do ministry, how I do relationships. I'll just I have a stack here and I'll I'll uh, I'll just show them to you. So emotionally healthy church. Um, this was a life changer uh, for me. Um, I, I think I just experienced so much unhealthy ministry over the course of my life um, and in in probably on the receiving and the giving in. Yes, I'll say both. I guarantee you. I've been on the receiving and on the giving in of unhealthy ministry. Uh, emotionally, a healthy church, it just really changed my world. And I feel like every every child of God needs to read this. Um, so that's that. And then this by Peter Scazzaro. I'm not getting paid for these, but uh, uh, <laughs> here, here's another book. This was a follow up to that called The Emotionally Healthy Leader. And basically, oh, you know, for the emotionally healthy church and emotionally healthy leader, the premise is you it is impossible to be spiritually mature mm -hmm. without being emotionally healthy. And this really God took me deep and really rewired some things in my life uh, with these books. Another one is Safe People. We're actually mm. doing a small group on this book right now. And, uh, and again, this was a game changer as far as the friendships in my life, standards I held, you know, even, even just what kind of person am I, how to find relationships that are good for you and avoid those that aren't. Um, this really was a game changer for me and, and it really helped my wife and I really align with people who shared 
uh, kindred spirits in, in, in uh, kindred vision for, for, you know, doing the work of God and, and, right. and you know, um, there's a lot of people who answer the call, but that aren't, aren't emotionally healthy and, and, you know, aren't healthy people. And so we saw, you know what, if we're, if we're going to be healthy people, we need to connect with healthy people. And obviously as a pastor, you're helping everybody who's healthy and unhealthy, but from a friendship standpoint, I don't have to remain in unhealthy relationships. Right. And so this is, this is huge with that. Um, choosing to cheat. I received this very early in ministry. Uh, Pastor Elliot recommended this book and gave this to all of us in those days. And, and it's an easy, short read, but basically the, 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 you know, the Bible, it talks about who wins when family and work collide or who wins when family and ministry collide. And really, you know, our family is our first ministry. And the truth is no one gets to the end of their life and says, I, I wish I spent more time counseling. I wish I spent more time working. I wish I spent more time, you know, doing that. It's more so I wish I spent more time with my spouse. I wish I spent more time with my kids because at the end of the day, you know, I think about it, brother Javier, I've worked with hundreds, if not thousands of young people. Right. But the truth is I have one son. And he will always be my son. And all the young people that I served while I was youth president, they've moved on with their life. But Malachi was and always will be my son. Good, bad, ugly. He will always be my son. If the Lord tarries 30, 40, 50 years from now, and I'm still here, he's still going to be my son. And, and, and Elissa Ford is going to always be my wife. And so family is the first ministry. Amen. Follow the lead. Uh, Awesome book by Brother Stan Gleason. I'll, I'll just move on here. Follow the lead. Awesome thing about you can't really know how to lead unless you first how to follow, learn how to follow. Leading on empty. Um, yeah. How, how to not lead on burnout. Had a few nervous breakdowns in ministry because I was doing too much. Uh, I was doing too much and not spending enough time with God. And then uh, three more real quick. Everyday Jesus, probably one of the most practical books on Christian living I've ever read. It just, I feel like any anybody from the season saint to a new convert can pick up this book and say, wow, I really know how to learn spiritual disciplines where I can walk with Jesus. And then the last two I'll say are for men. Um, Wild at heart and fathered by God. Um, I think every man I gave I gave Fathered by God. I've given all the men in our church these books for Father's Day. And I've given every man in my family and in my wife's family this book called Fathered by God. And, and it's it's learning what dad can never teach you. Wild at heart is discovering the secret of a man's soul and how God has called men uh, to go on an adventure following him. And so I know I mentioned a lot, but those are books that have deeply impacted my life. Um, deeply so amen okay. no that's good stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna Here's our readers that. yeah that's right that's right and uh that's what we've talked about so much on the show and and i'm gonna make sure i put it in the description box so that everyone again guys if you can just take the time if you buy one of those books and you can just invest your time to grow yourself that's what it is you're investing in you to grow to the next level uh it's it's well worth it so um, Brother Ed Ford, I, I am so appreciative of your time. Thank you so much for really the value that you, you dropped on so many to you that I, that I really pray. I really pray that they, especially those that do feel the calling to the ministry, anyone that, that is pursuing today, that they can take the opportunity to take note of what you've just shared today. Um, so I'm thankful for you, uh, for Sister Alyssa Ford, and she's a nurse. So I'm thankful for what she's doing today. All of our nurses and doctors battling against COVID. Thank you. Um, and so you and your family, the church, Lighthouse Tabernacle, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being on the show, uh, Brother Ed Ford. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Javi. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your wife, Shirley. And, and uh, we love you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. It was truly a blessing. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching the show today. If you enjoyed it, make sure to follow us and subscribe so you can stay up to date with the newest episodes and follow us on all social media platforms. So check out the links below.